Welcome to the Lean Blog Podcast. Visit our website at www.leanblog.org. Now, here's your host, Mark Graben. Hi, this is Mark Graben. You are listening to episode 93 of my podcast for July 2nd, 2010. Today's podcast was made possible uh, thanks to the organization Six Sigma IQ. You can find their website at sixsigmaiq.com. Jenna Weiss, their editor, uh, was kind enough to put me in touch with uh, today's guest, Jim Hearn. He is head of Lean and Six Sigma at the Heart of England NHS Foundation Trust, which is a, a hospital um, in England, part of the National Health Service. And in the interview today, um, Jim talks about his lean healthcare initiatives within the NHS, which have included implementing a 5S program um, early in the lean process and leveraging lean methods to decrease waiting time for patients going into surgery, among other improvements. Uh, So this was originally recorded um, as a webinar for them uh, in their blog talk radio series. So the call quality, the audio quality is a little bit different than usual, not quite as good, but you'll be able to uh, hear Jim talking about Lean in the UK. So I hope you enjoy uh, the podcast and the discussion. And again, thanks to Six Sigma IQ dot com. Uh, Jim is a speaker at their Lean Leaders event in London, which is taking uh, place next week, Monday and Tuesday, um, the fifth and sixth of July. I'm certainly happy to talk to uh, Jim Hearn. Thanks for joining us for the interview today. Hello. You're joining us from the UK um, and and the NHS, and happy you'll be able to share some of your experiences and perspectives uh, from from your work there. I was wondering if you could first introduce yourself and your current role within the NHS and and maybe talk a little bit about how you transitioned from uh, the manufacturing world into healthcare. Okay. Well, thank you, Mark. Um, Yes, my name is Jim Hearn. I'm head of Lean at the Lean Academy at Heart of England NHS Foundation Trust. And we've been running Lean Academy here for just about three years, probably about three and a half years. Uh, Transition from industry. Um, Yeah, with purpose, um, uh, I I chose to uh, find something very different. I think the the big appeal for me for the NHS was to really challenge my coaching ability and, and, and being in a position where I really don't understand the process. I'm not medically trained. So, um... I got to the point with factories where it was quite easy. If the, if the leadership was there from the top and people were willing to learn and wanting to make a difference, then I think it was quite easy to do this stuff in, in factories. So I was looking for a challenge, and uh, the NHS was it. Uh, so it's certainly been that, but very enjoyable. And I've, I've learned more about Lean and Six Sigma in the past three years and three years prior to that, which, mm-hmm. which is good. Now, when, uh, when you mentioned the Lean Academy. Could you describe it? Is that a training program that you have, or what do you mean by that? Yeah, it's. Um, I suppose primarily it's, it's a space and a team of people. Um, we've got a great team of people, uh, cross-skilled, uh, some people from, from industry, some people from uh, pathology, some midwives, um, some nursing background. Uh, and we've got some some people coming up through, through the organization who previously were doing pretty simple roles um, and have clearly demonstrated an ability to do a bit more than that. So yeah, we're a team of people with a dedicated location and within the location we facilitate improvement events, we train people, we've got an open course of training where about 25% of the trust have been through some of the training we give which uh, is 2,500 people. And it's, it's, it's just a space that's conducive to doing all stuff lean stuff around continuous improvement. Okay. And, you know, I often ask guests, especially when they come from the healthcare side, how they learned about lean, and, and clearly your introduction was uh, in industry and the manufacturing sector. Yeah. So I was wondering if you could, could tell us how um, Heart of England got introduced to lean. Was that concurrent with, uh, with, with you coming on board? Had they started, you know, a little bit uh, before your time, uh, I'm curious where the initial um, spark for that came from. Yeah, I was I was asked. Um, I know one of the exec directors, um, and uh, I was, whenever I was at a party, I kept being badgered to go and talk to them. So one day I said, "Yeah, I'd, I'll come and talk to you about Lean, um, Six Sigma, and process improvement." 
as long as you show me around a hospital, what's and all. So I, I, I took a day's annual leave and spent the morning talking to their board, um, just as openly and honestly as I could. I didn't have any intentions of, of moving at that point. Um, and then spent the afternoon looking around the hospital. Um, and it was, it was really interesting, some of these simple things that can capture you. I was in the first ever ward I've been in as a non-patient. Um, and, and I said, can, do you mind if I look in your cupboard? And I opened this door, and in, inside this cupboard, it was stuffed full of wheelchairs, absolutely stuffed full. And I said, that's a lot of wheelchairs you've got there. And she said, yes, yes, wheel, wheelchairs are like gold dust around here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, probably about an hour later, further around the hospital, I was in another ward, and I found another cupboard of wheelchairs. And again, the nurse said to me, yeah, wheelchairs, you know, you've got to keep hold of them because there just aren't very many. And I didn't say to her, well, that's probably because everybody's hiding them in their cupboards. Mm -hmm. But it's a thought that went through my head, and it was, it was that moment where I thought, we can do a lot of good work here. And, and so you're, you're referring to, you know, the, the lean methodology of, of 5S, and yeah. uh, I, I know from the work that you've done uh, that 5S has been, you know, an introduction uh, to lean, and, and it's provided um, you know, quite a bit of benefit. So could, could you maybe talk through a scenario where, you know, as you've been doing this work um, on, on board uh, at the NHS, what you know, such an impact you've had in terms of uh, staff life at the hospital? Yeah. Well, after that first day with the, uh, the trust board, they, they were interested and I was interested. So mm -hmm. um, we decided to do one small pilot piece of work in, um, in one of the wards with, with some, of the, some of the nurses and, and one of the housekeepers. Um, and we didn't do the whole ward, we probably did about 50%, and we spent about a week um, with two or three people from the nursing team released for each of those days. Uh, we did the linen storage areas, the equipment stores, uh, the food room, the food cupboard. We did quite a few areas, um, and at the end of it, we got our internal uh, sort of multimedia team to come and do a video, and they videoed the housekeeper. And I think the the thing that came across as most Im important was, and this is what the trust board saw and bought into, was that we've got a housekeeper who, prior to this, had been considered fairly negative, uh, talking passionately about the work that she and her colleagues had done, about the benefits that had brought them, in terms of saving time and being able to do more for patients. And, and that video was shown to quite a few members of the organization. And, and that, that's what got the trust board involved. So uh, that's a good example. And just recently, we've, we had a, a great example of uh, a very junior member of our team. Um, so he's, he's working for us in between a school and university. Uh, worked with the receipts and distribution area. So it's, it's, it's a warehouse function. Um, now, he had there a team of people who were just going through a consultation around redundancy. Uh, folded arms, negative attitude. Uh, and I remember um, supporting him in that first meeting where he tried to um, talk to them about the engagement that their, that their team leader had said that he'd like to achieve. And we took them through 5S training, and that was pretty much it. Uh, and over a period of three months, with a little bit of support, but very little really, probably about eight hours of support from anybody in my team, they've achieved uh, absolutely amazing progress. In fact, their, their area has gone from being akin to one of those programs on television where the, uh, the team come in and sort your house out, um, to being pretty close to what I would call a world-class warehouse. Um, and so it's, it's that very simple kind of work that, that just changes people's perception of work um, and whether they have the permission to make a difference. And I think that's absolutely fundamental because, you know, for me, lean is, lean is all about the respect for people. And when I talk about it, I say that, you know, the workers are your experts and the workers being the people closest to the work and therefore being the most expert and have done it most recently. And if you can't recognize that, then you cannot do 5S. Uh, so why move on to something more complicated, like just-in-time or total quality management or six mm -hmm. things, if you really can't do these basic things? The problem I find, though, is quite often senior management don't want to realize that it's the basics that they've been missing. Mm -hmm. So, well, yeah, yeah people, people always, 
people often want to find the latest and greatest gadget or technology or you know obviously it must be you know something new that they need as opposed to as you describe it something that would be very basic and fundamental right yeah exactly but you know I, what I always say to them is it's, it's, it doesn't matter whether it's basic um, it's not that easy it looks basic when you do it and it's one of those things isn't it it's hindsight 2020 vision but when you apply it you think oh my god we didn't think of that before um, but that's just the fact you didn't uh, and, and now you can see how simple it is and you can and you can take it forward and I think sure. that's, that's that's part of what my team does is, is just be that tiny little piece of catalyst that says come on here's something you can have a go here's some permission and a little bit of safety if you need it but you probably don't so you talk about starting with 5S and it seems like you know, one, of, one of the themes there is uh, the staff engagement and, and like you said respect for people that uh, 5S is a way of um, starting that engagement before you move on to more complex system improvement is that fair to say? Yeah, but I think in actual fact um, you know, we've ended up and, and Probably not purposefully, but, but for the best interest anyway. We've ended up doing a bit of both together. So the interesting thing about our trust is that we merged with another hospital. Um, it's sort of co-located geographically with us. And, and they'd had some external consultants in doing, doing some lean work as well. Um, and they're, they're a great company, um, and they did some good work. And, and they, they'd done the um, sort of the mostly typical pathway in the UK is of fractured neck of femurs. So uh, broken hips, mm -hmm. um, and, and they'd, they'd reduce the mortality on that pathway by about 40 to 50 percent, depending on how much um, covariance you remove. But they'd already created some interest there with the pathway redesign, and they'd not gone anywhere near the cultural foundations or the 5S stuff. So, so it's, it's good that um, since that merger, we've we've got both running concurrently, really. Mm -hmm. And some of the um, rapid improvement event style improvements we've run have um, have made improvements that have since declined and uh, in some of the areas where we've been doing 5S first that they're now running some of those more rapid improvement style approaches and they seem to be more sustainable as a result. So what, what do you think the factor is there of, of um, you know, having started with 5S versus just diving into um, these Kaizen events or rapid improvement events? Is it the, it's the level of, of staff engagement that, that occurs through 5S? I, I think, I think you're, it's, you're building upon that sound foundation mm -hmm. that uh, people are engaged, people can see the benefits of the simple stuff, and now they're asking for something that's a little bit more, um, more complicated to understand. It's more of an emotional journey as soon as you start mapping out entire patient pathways, um, and they're more likely to stick with it because uh, it can get it can get difficult. So I think I think that's really it. It's, it's you know the staff being more open-minded to it, um, and, and and already have sustained some simple things, which means they're more likely to sustain something more complicated, such as pulling patients to the right area. Mm -hmm. Now I know in some of the case examples you provided, you uh, talk quite a lot about um, reducing mortality and improving quality and safety. Um, yeah. could, you, could you share some examples of um, some of your results there and um, how you achieve that? Yeah, I think I mean, the headline results for, for mortality reduction, and it is the, um, the largest group of mortality within our trust, it's probably the same for most, is, is the fractured neck of femur pathway. So we, we've run that um, improvement event style um, activity at two hospitals. And they've come up with different actions at each hospital, but they've both managed to achieve a reduction that's significant. Um, I think it's running at around about four people per month less in terms of mortality. And those people are more likely to go home as well. It's interesting. We haven't actually reduced the length of stay on that pathway, but we have reduced the number of people going on to nursing homes, which which will have a benefit to the whole system in the future. Um, so we've got some clear mortality reduction there. The, in the other areas we've been working on, we found it very difficult to be able to translate improvements through to mortality reduction at a high level. Um, 
reducing the time people spend in hospital would undoubtedly translate through to a mortality reduction, but we've yet to be able to prove that statistically. So you know, the only big mortality impact we've had is in the necrophema pathway. There is some interesting work we're undertaking at the moment around uh, rapid access for lung cancer patients. Um, well, I think it's, you know, it's, it's well known that the speed at which we get people to services will, will, will uh, have a big impact on their survival rate. So um, th there's some work on that in the pipeline. But the only, the only really clear piece of quality improvement in terms of mortality that we've had coming through is, is from the fractured neck of femur pathway. But then in terms of quality and patient satisfaction, you know, the, very, the, the first piece of um, process improvement work, rather than just the 5S that we did, was in uh, one of our fracture clinics, where the average waiting time for the patient was 67 minutes. And we ran a pilot for a week, which was um, time consuming to arrange. We didn't have the systems in place to run like this continually. But we manually planned a week-long uh, clinic session. Uh, with different times and a very different operating schedule, and we managed to run that with every patient waiting less than a minute. So it was a good case study, um, and the feedback from the patients was um, very, very good, uh, and the data showed a big change. Uh, the problem we've been having with that is how to create a system where we can run like that continually, and that's needed quite a lot of IT support, which we are implementing in the next couple of months. Uh, and we'll be able to review whether it carries on at that one minute waiting time. But a lot of the a lot of the pathways we worked with we worked with ophthalmology around the number of visits patients have for uh, cataracts. And um, I don't know whether you've studied a, an ophthalmology pathway, but the the, the, the previous uh, process was was that you'd come in, and the consultant would would verify that you do indeed have a have a cataract, and then you'd go away and come back for a follow up appointment for your biometry, and then another follow-up appointment with the consultant to review the biometry, um, and then you'd get booked for surgery uh, with a pre-op assessment appointment as well. So, you know, working with the teams on that to, to understand why did the patient have to leave in between each of these steps, could we schedule the clinic in such a way for it to be a one-stop shop? Mm -hmm. um, and again, that's something that's been put into place. Uh, the interesting thing from that was when, when, I, when we were mapping the current state with the ophthalmology team, I interviewed a patient, and I asked them what time their appointment was. And I said to him, God, that was uh, 40 minutes ago. Um, and he said, yes, yes, yes. I said, do you think that's acceptable? He said, yes, totally. <laughs> I expect to wait that long. <laughs> and I bring a book with me for it. And this is an ophthalmology patient. He's, he's bringing a book <laughs> to read while we make him wait for 40 minutes. Um, so I was, I was really quite shocked that um, you know, one of our customers, is not only expecting to wait that long, but quite happy. Uh, and overall, he rated our hospital excellent. So it's, it's, it's quite an interesting one, the quality and, and, and the uh, patient perspective, because I'm not sure that our patients expect the high level of <laughs> service that they get elsewhere. Right. Well, I mean, I, I think, yeah, people have been conditioned um, to expect to wait, and so I, mean, I guess it's a, a matter, unfortunately, of you know, just having to um, to meet uh, you know, expectations from from previous um, experiences, but uh, you know, even if they're not bothered by a oh, wait in the waiting room, I think there's some cases where improvements with lean that that improve access to care, uh, re reducing waiting time to get in for surgery can can make a a clear yeah. measurable impact on on quality and outcomes. And I was wondering if you could talk about the case you had shared with me where you. You, you took a look at uh, patient waiting time to get in for surgery. If you could tell yeah. us about yeah. some of the improvements that were made there in the process that you went through. Yeah. Well, again, um, this is a, an interesting story, which is a function of our trust, um, and that we have somebody working for us who is, um, is unique, I would say, um, and, and unique in a, a, a positive way, that um, while studying uh, medicine, he was. Uh, he found it uh, a little bit too easy going. So also did a degree in computer science. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, and he's a vascular surgeon. So he's got that brain around flow and constraints and bottlenecks. Um, but also with the computer science qualifications, also got that understanding around system and process. So um, yeah, hugely intellectual guy. Um, 
voracious uh, researcher and reading reader around the subject. And he actually started work in his own vascular clinic about seven or eight years ago. Um, and at the time, he didn't know that you could call it lean if you chose to. Um, mm -hmm. So he, he, he's a member of the lean team now. So um, he, he does surgery uh, three days a week, and he, he does two days a week working for, for the lean team. So we've got a great clinical advocate there. And, and, and uh, he led this work. And if you, if you look at the case study, it is simple stuff. Um, so the first thing, and, and I find this remarkable, the, the first thing was on a control chart of successive patients and how long it took them to get to surgery from being um, added to the waiting list. I know we call it a waiting list. Um, by looking at a control chart of that, they suddenly realized that two, the two people who do the work, the surgeons, had both taken the month of August off. Hmm. And the waiting list had increased. For me, uh, it's interesting that you need a control chart to point that out to you, but <laughs> this, this, is, this is what's great about the NHS. So the, the, these two surgeons looked at their control chart and said, why is that? And it was only then they said, oh, you took August off as well. I thought it was just me. Um, so the first <laughs> thing they looked at was um, how do they work around and what, what does their cycle time have to be to meet their tack time? So you know, the first simple points around tack time and cycle time. And what they looked at was they said, well, actually, um, we'll never catch up. Once we've lost this time from us being away, we never catch up because our average capacity is our average demand. And that's when we're running, so we've never allowed the yeah. time when we're on annual leave of study leave. And they needed to take their list from, um, from six patients to seven. Now, because they had all the patients arriving in the morning, the reception staff didn't feel they could cope with any more than six. And they didn't have a big enough waiting room anyway. And they quite often finish their theatre list half an hour before the end anyway. So by looking at that um, and just using a Gantt chart, a simple tool, um, they realized that if they got these patients to arrive slowly throughout the day, obviously having to work around the consent process, um, that they could actually get seven in because of the waiting room not being constrained or the mm -hmm. reception staff. Um, and it is, it is hard to believe we've got these expensive resources that are not the constraint because we've got batches going on upstream. So they made those changes and all of a sudden they could do seven in a day. And, and indeed the waiting list came down. Um, the interesting thing is they didn't stop at that because they were then achieving easily the national target which is 18 weeks from referral to treatment. So they're achieving 12 weeks from outpatients to treatment. Um, but what they decided was that they were running it around about eight weeks, if I remember rightly. What they decided was that because their annual leave booking notice period was six weeks, they'd like the waiting list to be lower than that so they wouldn't book people on and then cancel them. So they looked at their, their processes again within the theatres um, and made some changes to the way they operate and then moved on to being able to do eight. Uh, and that's where they are now. They, they, they plan seven, um, but they can flex their cycle time to eight if they need to to catch up at any point. Uh, and they've been running like that ever since. I, I think they're now operating in around about four weeks, which, which is quite an achievement, but led by a surgeon. So um, if you can get a clinical champion of that degree, then, then you'll do very well. Yeah. Well, I mean, that, that's great to hear that improvement, and, uh, you know, compared to that, target. I mean, at their worst, you know, targets uh, can, can be dysfunctional where, where people uh, in, improve to the point of hitting a target and then stop. But it sounds like in, in your case, there was a drive to, to truly uh, improving the patient experience and, and bringing down the variation, bringing down that average uh, as low as possible rather than just being satisfied with hitting a target, correct? Yes. And, and, and the other thing I find with targets is um, the way we choose to interpret them and react to them in the NHS it, it, it needs to be managed because you know, prior to going to the NHS, um, I worked for a paper company. Now, if we said, okay, we're going to have a one-week rapid improvement event and we're going to take the speed of this machine from X to X, um, if I came back at the end of the week and it was running at the higher speed, but producing paper that was not sellable, then you know, you'd be quite rightly annoyed. And it wouldn't yeah. happen because... You know, no one would say, oh, well, you said run it that fast. 
no one would say that. Everybody knows that it, it means run it that fast with sellable product. And yet, a lot of the targets in the NHS, we somehow take that as permission to ignore quality. And I think that's the interesting thing. So that, you know, the four-hour target for the emergency departments, it, it is not um, an invitation to put patients in inappropriate places in the hospital. <laughs> it, it is an invitation to get your process functioning in such a way that the flow can achieve that capability. But we don't, we don't translate it very well sometimes. Yeah, and, and that's not just a uh, NHS or healthcare problem. That's a uh, um, you know, human failing that, that even going back to Dr. Deming, he would talk about. Um, Brian Joyner is another management author who comes to mind. He, he said, well, you know, when you give people targets, you, know, you can do three things. You can fudge the numbers, you can fudge the system, or you can actually yeah. make improvement. And yeah. um, you know, that actually making improvement is the... Uh, the hardest to do, but it's the right path instead so of just playing yeah. playing games with the numbers. Um, so, which is the intent of the targets. Yeah. It, it's true system improvement. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, maybe one, one last area to go into, um, talking about you know, people and culture and, and management. You know, you've touched on the frontline staff engagement and how Lean can get them involved in process redesign and, and make their, their workplace um, a better one. Um, I, I know you're just a couple years into your Lean journey there, but uh, can you talk a little bit about some of the progress that you've made with management and, and leadership at different levels of, of getting them to embrace or, or starting to embrace kind of uh, Lean management concepts um, so yeah. that it's not just the frontline yeah. staff? Yeah. Um, I, I tend to view it as, as uh, there's four groups, really. Um, there's clinical, um, consultants, surgeons, doctors, that group of stuff. Um, and there's nurses, and then there's, there's the operational teams, and then there's the, the board of directors, um, who aren't really operational teams, um, although they do have operational functions. In terms of the clinicians, um, they fit exactly your classic distribution of um, early adopters and naysayers. Uh, there are some people who um, are a couple of years away from retirement um, and aren't really that interested. Um, and, there are, and there are some people who really embrace it. Um, and, and there's a whole raft of people in between. I mean, it, a great, I had to remind myself of, of it being an achievement. About six weeks ago, I had one of our clinical directors who's um, in charge of cardiology who three years ago sat in a room with me and said, patients who attend with chest pain um, and improvement of that as a pathway is completely inappropriate and I'm not having anything to do with lean. Hmm. Um, and after half an hour of, of uh, discussion, we ended up getting nowhere. Um, about six weeks ago, we finished a current state map of the cardiology process and he stood there and said, um, it's been a complete revelation to me. Mm. I can't believe that three years ago I didn't want to do this. And, and now I can see everything that's wrong with the service and our action plan, and I'm going to deliver it. So you know, that's an interesting case of, of some movement away from some of the naysayers. Um, but they're a good group. Um, if you talk to them about quality and patient care, then they, they will... Um, act in, in exactly the right way, um, and, and they care about that. If you come to them and talk about money and, and benchmark them against other people and other organizations in terms of efficiency and productivity, then it turns them off completely. Right. Um, so that's the simple, simple thing. Talk to them about quality. Um, and have faith that the money will come out of that and be able to translate it to finance, which is the bit I'll talk about in a bit, the board. Um, nurses. Nurses are passionate people who've come to healthcare because they care about patients. And we have put in systems and workplaces that take them away from that care. Uh, if you help them put that back, then um, they'll be completely 100% behind you. Um, so again, I don't have any problem with the engagement there. That's working well. Um, I think operational people is where it becomes tricky because I don't think... Um, we have been training and developing the leadership skills of our operational teams well enough. Yeah. Um, and I, I see a massive skills gap. In fact, just 
putting a filter into Excel can scare some managers. Um, other managers are great at that, but um, talking to a group of people and with a presentation might, might not be up their street. So, I mean, that, that wide gamut of skills that I went through um, in my industrial training and my experience is severely lacking in the NHS. And I think we can put a lot of effort into developing their skill set. Um, and that's where we, I have to frame lean internally to say we are not here to do process improvement for you. We're here to give you the skills to be able to do it yourself and coach you through that. Um, and then when you get to um, the board level, um, I do find that there's far more focus on money. Um, well, not far more. I mean, there is a heavy focus on money, and quite rightly, yeah. at, the, at the moment, the NHS has got a huge black hole in its finances. And any other organization would focus in on the money. But what is easier and clearer is the translation of quality into cost. So a good example of this is our number one metric for theatres is utilization. And we consider utilization to be when there is a surgeon in the theatre, not when there is a patient and a surgeon being operated mm -hmm. in the theatre. So if I'm, a, if I'm a surgeon and I want to get 100% utilization, I just turn up when I'm meant to. Yeah. So as well, soon as we start working with surgeons to do more cases per list and remove the waste in between and the setups and, and everything else that you do, it doesn't show up in the metrics. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's the, the interesting bit where the translation of operational performance from the board and to the board is, is tricky. So there's this big mis mismatch and I think goal deployment mechanisms um, would be hugely valuable for people. Um, and it's getting to the point where you can suggest that and influence it, mm -hmm. uh, as well as having some, some decent cost tree drivers around you know, uh, working capital, what's the true cost of inventory, uh, how much does a bed day cost? I'm yet to get clarity on the answer for that. Um, different people have said different things over the, over the years. Um, how much does a minute of theatre time cost? And whenever I do these translations and say that currently we don't measure the right thing, it's not, we're not measuring the value-added component. As soon as I put the measurement of the value-added component in and translate it for you, I get people saying, mm, well, I'm not sure whether you've done that correctly. I'm not sure whether I believe it. Right. But it's, 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 it's quite an interesting period uh, where I've got a lot of case studies of good work and clinicians and nurses and a good group of the operational teams all appreciate what we're doing. But because of the metrics of the organization not really focusing on a value added, it's hard for me to highlight the benefits in terms of money, sure. uh, which, is, which is an important role, uh, carrying out that translation. So it's, 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 it's a big area of work that I think um, you know, anybody going into lean in healthcare would, needs to consider at the very beginning. I never considered it um, to be an issue. Uh, right. And it's only when you get under the skin you realize that most of our metrics, I mean, I assumed that our utilization metric would be the same as you'd use in a factory. Mm -hmm. So when we start making changes to theaters and it doesn't show up in the utilization metric, I'm scratching my head thinking, I wonder why that is. And mm -hmm. it's next to find out of how we actually measure it. Yeah, well, that, that's an important lesson and um, you know, a, a good point. I appreciate you um, sharing that. So. Um, I think we'll, we'll, we'll have to wrap up uh, for now, unfortunately, but um, yeah, Jim Hearn from Heart of England NHS Foundation Trust, um, thank you for joining me today, um, sharing some of your story. Uh, I know there's a lot of work that you're doing. Maybe we can uh, get together another time and do a follow-up discussion. Okay. Thank you, Mark. I would love to. And good okay. luck to anybody who's, who's trying to do this in healthcare. Okay. Thanks, Jim. Okay. Thank you, Mark. And thank you, Mark and Jim, for coming on to our program today. To access all Six Sigma IQ's Profit Through Process podcasts, along with articles, columns, interviews, webcasts, blogs, and information on IQPC events, visit www.sixsigmaiq.com. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. This has been the Lean Blog Podcast. For lean news and commentary updated daily, visit www.leanblog.org. If you have any questions or comments about this podcast, email mark at leanpodcast at gmail.com.